<laughs> I never know quite whether to have my glasses on or glasses off. I had an eye test this week, and I desperately need... They're so scratched that I've had them years. Um, so scratched that uh, I desperately need new glasses. It's kind of... For some things like reading, I can just about make do without them, and sometimes when looking at the screen, I need... Anyway, so if I put them on and off, it's because I'm struggling a bit. Um, I want to thank the worship team, first of all, because I don't know, unless you do preaching, it's very difficult to explain, but um, had the call yesterday... Uh, I was just having dinner with my mum and dad, as I normally do on a Saturday. Lisa phoned up, can you do the preach tomorrow? Right, yeah, okay, because I'd thought, I'd looked at Nehemiah a bit, and uh, there was things on my heart that I really felt that uh, I'd like to share uh, and bring out from the story. But it's been interesting, because since that call and now... What I'd got on my heart to bring really has totally changed. And then I came this morning and uh, Dorothy uh, got hold of me and uh, just really brought something that confirmed what I'd I'd put down on pen to paper, which we'll look at in a bit. But then the song started. Can you remember what song we started with? My testimony. Yeah. Yeah. So unless you're a preacher, you don't really understand how sometimes you can really just see things in songs that you don't, uh, don't always see if you're just singing the songs. But my testimony, what a great way to start, because that links so nicely with uh, what we're going to look at today. Then there was another song, A Great Is Your Faithfulness, which I'll perhaps finish with because it had some really good words in there that um, I really want to bring out. Uh, So thanks to the worship team. The songs were great choices. But I want to ask you a really personal, challenging question to start off with. I'm not here to put you on the spot. But I want to ask you a question. We're looking at this theme of rebuilding. And the book of Nehemiah in the Bible is key. One of the key books that we can really learn about uh, rebuilding. So I want to ask you a question. Have you or are you reading the book of Nehemiah? I wonder if anyone's brave enough to say, yes, I am actually. We should be brave enough, shouldn't we? Yeah. (laughs) Have you read or are you reading? Anyone reading Nehemiah at the minute? Anyone? Just a couple of people. I want to encourage you because we're going to have a look at Nehemiah. Uh, Mandy touched on it a bit last week, but it's such a key book. I don't think that I'm so spiritual because when I came to prepare, I thought, oh, I know where Nehemiah is. Tried to find it, couldn't find it. I thought, oh, hold on, I mean, it's moved. Where is it? Where is it? I ended up having to use the index to find out where Nehemiah was. Uh, So don't look at me as someone super spiritual because I really am not. But uh, the book of Nehemiah is is a personal account. It's Nehemiah's testimony of what happened, what he did. And I really want to encourage you, church, every one of you, uh, to find the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament and to read it. But you might think, as you start to read it, what is a book like this doing in the Bible? What is a book about rebuilding actually doing in the Bible. Why should I read this book? Well, it's an historical book. The Bible has some books of history which are important. They're in there for a reason and we need to understand that and get to grips with it. Nehemiah is one of those books. Some of it is easy to read Uh, The first few chapters, really quite easy to follow about Nehemiah's story in the account. And then suddenly, like like bits of the Old Testament, there starts to be the, and I won't deny this, there are some long lists of names. And you're probably thinking, whoa, I'm not going to read that. What are they in there for? And they're difficult to read. Get an audio Bible. 
So that, that'll be easier. That's all I can say. So some of it's easy. Some of it is just long lists of names that are difficult. But it's a book of history. And you know what? My feeling is that the modern church, and Alford likewise, is not good at recording history of what God has done in our past. And Nehemiah is a book that records the history of what happened to the Jews at this time. It relates from time to time in a certain month this happened. Do we ever do that in this church? Are we good at it? I don't think we are. And there's something important to grasp about actually writing down, recording, making notes of what God has done in our past to remind us of his faithfulness. It's important to remember key events and what God has done. I put a little note here. We used to go, uh, Natasha's away this weekend, we're picking her up this afternoon, so Natasha and Elijah are away. But our other daughter, Rihanna, um, had, both of the girls have got Crohn's. Rihanna, when I first got together with uh, Lisa, was very poorly. Um, had to have quite a lot of operations, big operations, uh, for such a, a young kid. Um, and she went through so much. And we were at hospital all the time. We visited every hospital you could think of uh, numerous times, waited for hours to see uh, the doctors. We've done all of that. Uh, if you've been there, you'll know what, what it's like. But one thing I do remember is that every time we used to see her uh, doctor, Dr. Moss, um, he would bring out this huge file of Rihanna's. She was only about 13, 12, 13. Huge file. And he would open it up. Mm, 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 mm. And then he would ask us, every time he would ask us, now, Rihanna, this is Rihanna, 13. Now, Rihanna, it was something like, can you tell me, what operations have you had? It was like, whoa. It was like being in mastermind black chair. Oh, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I can't remember. Um, hold on a minute. And, and we were like thinking, well, you feel like saying, well, you've got the file. Read it. Come on. You know, there it is. Come on. And we were like, uh, you know. I'm terrible at remembering things like that. And it was like, she'd had these major operations. What well, was it last year? Uh, I can't remember whether it was last year. Um, what was it year before? And he was sat there with all the answers in front of him. And we're like, uh, and uh, we'd go away. We'd come back six months later. Now, Rihanna, uh, what operations have you had? It would be like, oh, no, why didn't I write it down? We could have just, yes, in 2012, uh, she had this operation. Two thousand. But we didn't. We didn't write it down. There was nothing to remember. Our memory was, we could vaguely remember, but we couldn't remember the details. And what a book like Nehemiah does is it records the history of what happened to the Jews at this time. And that's important. Don't dismiss it. Don't dismiss those books, those lists that seem boring, because they're in there for a reason. And we need to learn and understand why they're there and, and how we as church can do the same. So let me give you a bit of background. If you've not read the book of Nehemiah, I fully understand. Please try. Try and read it. Um, we're just going to look at a few bits from chapter 1 today to really give us a bit of background. But please try and find it. Try and read it. It's good stuff. The Bible is a living, breathing word of God. And although these events, let me give you uh, some background, that what we read in Nehemiah happened about a thousand years after Moses. Now we've heard of Moses, yeah? So this happened about a thousand years after Moses. It's about 400 years before Jesus. So that gives you a bit of the context. And what had happened 
was that the Babylonians had conquered Jerusalem. And Solomon's grand temple, this beautiful temple, was destroyed. The Babylonians had deported almost all the Jews. And we think of what's going on in uh, Ukraine at the minute, where an aggressor had come in. This is what had happened. The aggressor had come in. And not only that, but the Babylonians had taken the city, destroyed it, and then deported, taken virtually everyone out of that city and deported them to the rest of the empire. That's what had happened to the Jews. But some of them were raised up in exile into prominent positions. And you may have heard of these names. People like Daniel. What a great book. Bit of a mystery at times. But, again, these are key books to read and understand in the Old Testament. Read it. About Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. People that went in that fire, that furnace. Stories that you will have told. Stories that perhaps we're teaching our children. Actually, they're in there. These people were exiled Jews. But they gained prominent positions. Esther, I was thinking to myself, I haven't read the book of Esther for such a long time. We did a study on it years ago. Um, great story. And she became a queen of a Persian king. Again, only a few chapters long. Read, try and find it. Look up the index. Find it. Read it. It's a great story. But after years in exile, the first Jews began to return. Nehemiah wasn't the first to go back. Zerubbabel had led the first group back. Ezra had led the second group back. And Nehemiah here leads the third group back of Jews some 15 years after Ezra and almost 100 years after Zerubbabel had returned. Nehemiah returned to find the temple restored, but the walls of the city were still rubble. If you're going to read and understand the story of Nehemiah, you've got to understand that what he went back to was rubble, the temple had been rebuilt, but the city walls were rubble. They had been destroyed. Now, I want to take a minute just to go over this with you because it's almost lost on us in the modern day the importance of city walls. But in the ancient world, a city without walls was completely open and vulnerable to its enemies. No defense, no protection. City walls were essential in the ancient world. They offered safety and they symbolized strength and peace. An unwalled city had nothing valuable in it. The temple, for example, even though it had been restored, rebuilt, it could never be made beautiful because anything valuable would be taken and plundered. No wonder that the people were in a similar condition. In fact, in Nehemiah 1, glasses, <laughs> bear with me. Nehemiah 1, verse 3. I think it is, if we're able to bring that up. They said to me, those who survive the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. So, we read here, right at the very start, that word had come back to Nehemiah that the people were in great trouble and disgrace. In fact, it, it's really interesting that they're called survivors. 
a word that we perhaps wouldn't use. But, you know, when we come to church, we're not called survivors. Oh, I survived that service this morning. Oh, <laughs> oh worship. Oh, what a test. The preach. Wow. Oh dear. Made it through, though. Oh. <laughs> it's not really a word we link with the people of God. But the exiled people who had returned, word had got back to Nehemiah. Remember these first groups, Zerubbabel first, Ezra second. They were in great trouble and disgrace. But then what really broke Nehemiah's uh, heart was that the wall of Jerusalem was broken down and the gates had been burned with fire. It's important to note that Nehemiah was an exile. He'd never lived in Jerusalem. He'd never been there. But being a Jew, he'd heard of the majesty of this city, of the temple. It was a special place. God was in there. The presence of God was there. And the Jews linked into Jerusalem and Nehemiah when he heard the news of Jerusalem it was like well this is the thing that really struck me when I read Nehemiah 1 first he wept he wept bitterly and he got on his knees and he fasted and prayed he'd never been there he'd never seen it but the response from this man was to get on his knees and start crying and fasting and praying for the city, the temple, Jerusalem, that he loved so much. But what I want to focus on mostly today is his prayer, because it's just key. There's so much in Nehemiah, and I, as a preacher, you're trying to fit it all in, squeeze it all in. I was writing this morning my notes and thinking, hold on a minute, after about half an hour, I was thinking, I wasn't really going to write and say any of this. Well, I've just wasted half an hour. I've only got an hour and a half left. Come on, get on with it. But that's the, the preacher just wants to try and fit it all in. What do I miss out? There is so much that I could say that I'm not going to say today that we can explore as we look at this book. But let me, what would I really want you to go away with? That in a rebuilding project, what is fundamental? What is key? If Mandy is thinking that we're in a season of rebuilding, what is going to be fundamental for us as church? I'll tell you what it is, because it's straight here in Nehemiah 1. It's prayer. We can come up with all sorts of amazing ideas, projects, things to do. Brilliant, yeah. They tick lots of boxes. But the most important thing that Nehemiah did and that we can do in part, as part of this rebuilding process is to pray. But here's the key, church, and I want you to hear this as we look at this prayer. This isn't a prayer of, oh, God, hmm, make it better. Oh, God, Find someone else to do the job, because I'm busy. I've got a lot on. You know, God, I've got a lot on. No. As we look at this prayer, you'll see it's a specific way of praying. That actually, church, if we get to grips with it, it's not only going to help rebuild what God wants to do here. It's going to do amazing things. It's going to do the impossible. Things that you think, no way, we haven't got the money for it. No way, we can't do it. No, I'm going to stand on your word, God. You've said you're, you can do this, and I pray in Jesus' name. We'll be amazed at what we start to see happening as we pray. So go away from this place today knowing that the most important thing we can do is to pray. But how do we pray? Nehemiah starts, 
once he'd heard the news, and he gets on his knees, and he fasts, and he prays, he says in verse 5, uh, Justine, if we can bring that up. For some day, yep, okay. Then I said, so this is the start of his prayer. Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God. That's how he starts his prayer. He recognizes who God is. He is the Lord of heaven, and he is a great and awesome God. We need to start by acknowledging who God is. As we pray, it's not about, right, God, we've got this project. We need this amount of money. Right, God, hear our prayers. No. It's about putting him in his rightful place. You are God of heaven, Lord of all, awesome, great. If we go on, uh, Justine, a little bit. Verse 6. He says this in his prayer. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying. Ears be attentive and eyes open. Hold on. He's saying that to God. God, let your ears be attentive, your eyes open. Hear my prayer. That's bold praying. But actually... It is that, but it's recognizing that only God can hear and answer his prayer. There are many gods, but only God, his God, our God, could help. If only God would hear, Nehemiah knew God would help. So it puts God in his rightful place, acknowledges his greatness, acknowledges that only God can hear this prayer and answer it. But then what does Nehemiah do? He says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. Nehemiah confessed the sin. And it's interesting, Nehemiah confesses the, not just his sins, but the sins of the whole community, the Israelites, what they had done. Myself and my father's house have committed against you. Nehemiah confessed the sin without any attempt at excusing it. That's something I've personally really taken from looking at this over the last day. That confession of our sins is simply confessing what we have done wrong. It's not excusing it. God doesn't want to hear that. He doesn't need to hear that. He doesn't need a reason why we have done that. The pattern of this prayer is that simply Nehemiah confessed his sins and the sins of the Israelites and left it at that. The Message Bible, I really like, I didn't have time to look at some of the other versions. The message, which is a tr um, paraphrase. Thank you. <laughs> it says this. I really like this. Eugene Peterson says this little bit like this. We've treated you like dirt. We haven't done what you told us, haven't followed your commands, and haven't respected the decisions you gave to Moses, your servant. Wow. Wow. Now that's confession. Telling God that we've treated him like dirt. 
and haven't done the things that he wanted us to do. That's an honest confession before God. Can you start to see how we should be praying? Not this wishy-washy or oh, sound, soundbite prayer that's going to impress the person sat next to us. It's a intimate, passionate, just get to the nitty gritty type of prayer. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for a people that will get on their knees, weep, fast, pray, acknowledge who he is and put him in his rightful place and confess their sins before him. No excuses, no need to excuse it. Don't waste his time, just confess your sins. But then he goes on, verses 8 to 10. Let me have a look. Verses 8 to 10, so, <clears throat> he says, remember, remember. He comes back to that what I started with, testimony, written record, history, writing it down, remember. We are not good at it. But something came to Nehemiah's mind as he began to pray. He said, remember the instruction you gave to your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and what? Obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling. Wow. Nehemiah remembered the promises to, given to Moses, and he brought it into his prayer. It was specific. It's, yeah, it's reminding God. God doesn't need reminding, but it reminded God of that promise that he had made to Moses. And Nehemiah is saying that even if the exiles are scattered all over, if we will return to you and obey your commands, what will God do? He will bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling. There's something powerful in remembering the promises of God. There's something that will transform our prayer life as a church, and it will transform this rebuilding project that's going to take place here. It will transform it by remembering what God has promised in our prayers we can stand on it. You said it, God, and we're praying, and we're not going to stop praying until you do it, because you are God of heaven, and you do not break your promises. That's effectively what he was saying to God. This is a, the more I think about it, maybe I was tired this morning at half six, I didn't see it, but this, this is a bold prayer, is it not? This isn't a, oh, God... I've heard the walls are down. If only you would send someone, uh, I can't think of anyone, uh, send someone to do the job. It'd be great, wouldn't it? It might take a while, but well, your God, you know. Well, you can see how we can become so wishy-washy. This was a powerful, pointed prayer that reminded God of the promise he had made. And he was, he's a God of, who fulfills his promises. Which brings me back to the song that you sang. Because it stood out to me so clearly. Great is your faithfulness. We will stand, we will stand on your promises. And as I saw those words, I thought, I haven't got a pen. Uh, so I had to find, there was one here, so I wrote it down. Then Lisa said, it doesn't look good. Yeah, they'll think that you're still finishing off your preach. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that song choice was so good because we can sing those words I will stand, I will stand, I will stand on your promises but, but if we link that into our prayer life individually and corporately that says God you have promised this for Alford you said this years ago to our servants. 
And we're praying about it because you're God in heaven and you can do it. You don't let, let your people down. You don't break your promises. We're going to pray about this in Jesus' name. That will transform the prayer life of this church. I really do believe it. I will stand on your promises. But that led me to think, what promises has God made to Olford? You see, for us, we've only just recently, we just only just started coming in a, sen- in a historical sense. We don't know what words have been spoken over Olford. And I think one of the keys in this whole process for Mandy, for Martin, for the trustees, for the core leaders, is to perhaps pray and think about and be reminded of those specific words and promises that have been spoken over this fellowship maybe years ago that we can start to really pray about and stand on. Now, things might come to mind straight away. People like Alan, David, uh, Celia, you know, faithful people over the years. Maybe you need to just sit down and take a moment during the week and just pray that God will bring to mind some of the promises that have been spoken over uh, this church. And maybe when Mandy gets back, it will be opportune to, to sort of sit down and just to write some of these down. Write them down and say, these are the things that stand out that we want to pray about. Just a little sort of thing to bring to you as a church, because... To be honest, we're exiles. And, you know, I don't stand here. I was going to start with this, but anyway. I don't stand here as someone who knows it all. For most of my Christian life, virtually all of it has been at Hope House in Mablethorpe. But we took a decision, Lisa and myself, to come out literally just before the pandemic started a time of turmoil for everyone we thought about joining Skegness didn't feel that was right Uh, and then after the sort of lockdown had ended uh, because of the friendship that Lisa had with Mandy we decided to come here on a Sunday now I want to be really honest with you I can't say, and hear me when I say this, this doesn't feel like home to me. And I want to be honest with you. It doesn't feel like home. And unless you've experienced being exiled, you won't understand it. I get where Nehemiah is coming from and how he must have felt in that sense. This doesn't feel like home. But I want to also say, that I'm grateful for the welcome that people have given us. We've started to develop friendships which are valuable and spiritually uh, valuable to us. And there's still some people that I know very little about. But that's church life, isn't it? You get to know them over 10, 20 years. But (laughs) just as you're leaving, bye. (laughs) Um, But hear me when I say it doesn't feel like home. But the strange thing is, and we were talking about this on the way over, is that what's been strange for me personally, not for Lisa, but for me personally, is that I still find it hard in here, uh, sort of emotionally. I know you shouldn't go on your emotions, but I don't feel it in here a lot of the time hope you get what I'm saying. And yet, I've come to the understanding, perhaps, that you don't need to feel it in church. Because I've been given the opportunity to preach more than I ever did uh, for a number of years at Hope House. And I'm thinking, hold on a minute, you know, God has opened a door in a way that I would never have expected. I don't feel like I used to feel at Mablethorpe, stood up, preaching, worship leading, etc. 
But I'm not going on my feelings anymore. Because actually, God is still God. And I think this is something that I'm taking out of Nehemiah. That it's not about feelings. That exile feeling of being away from home. It must have been really strange for these Jews. And that's where I'm coming from. Sometimes, and I, I shan't deny it, sometimes even in the worship, I just can't get going with the worship. And I used to lead worship for, for years. It's so strange. I hope you get what I'm saying. So if I look a bit grumpy, <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah, I am. That feeling of exile, that's where we're, we're at. And let me just make it very clear. People are, some people have said, ooh, why are Michael and Lisa at Alford? Can I just say, I don't know why we're here. We are not here to take over Mandy and Martin's role. I'm not here to take over worship, because my voice isn't what it used to be. I've turned 50 now. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> so I'm leaving that to the worship team. I, we're not here for any reason except, actually, we're here, we are here for one reason. Because of the friendship with Mandy. And there's something in Mandy that we like to follow. And get behind and support and encourage that's why we're here. No other agenda at all. But it doesn't feel like home. It's such a strange feeling. And maybe you don't get that. But at the same time, some of you I know have been really faithful here. Some of you over the period, and I was reflecting really of the time that I've known where Louth... Uh, Lee Goodwin, uh, Mike Burkett, Mark Rowe, um, Roy, and uh, now Mandy. And we were reflecting that in all that time, Nigel's been at Hope House. We've had that stability in that sense, but you've not in that sense. And the Bible and the book of Nehemiah can actually really help you as a church, I think. And it's so exciting what Mandy's got on her heart and how she's going to bring this out. It's really exciting. Because let me say this without really offending you. And if you want to walk out, you can walk out. But <laughs> Shall I tell you how I feel spiritually as I've come to Alford, how I see Alford? It's like a city with its walls that are broken. Now, I don't say that to disrespect you that have been faithful, please. But spiritually, as we've come, I, and that's why this book is so key, I feel that Alford is like that Jerusalem. Its city walls are in utter mess. And what that leads to, as we've read, is that it leaves a vulnerability, it leads to an insecurity, dare I even say, it leads to chaos. And it leads the people to great distress and trouble. Now hear me when I say it, because there is great hope in this book. So let me say it first, and then we can think about how God is going to start to rebuild and do something amazing in this place. Because the way I see it, in all that you've gone through over the years that I've been in Mablethorpe and that we've had those links with Mablethorpe and Alford. And coming here from the pandemic, I would say spiritually, you're like a church with the walls that are in total 
disrepair, rubble, chaos. You've been through so much, not just with the pandemic, but with all sorts of other things that you're trying to deal with now. But there is great hope, I think, because firstly, I see in Mandy, not just a Peter character, who's bold and gets on with things, but I see a real Nehemiah in her, who has got a passion for this place and who wants to see God rebuild. And that's exciting, when God wants to rebuild and restructure something. And my question to you is, do you want to be part of that? Do you want to be involved in that? Lord, you made a promise to Moses and this nation. Well, I'm asking now for you to make good on it. Faithful people of Alford, I want you to go away, write down what things have been promised over this church so that we exiles because there's a few of us that have joined you in this journey, can begin to pray about and to pray specifically about. It's a secret to great power in prayer to plead the promises of God, to stand, stand on your promises, to say, you promised us this. We want to believe for it in this season. But, verse 11. Verse 11, Nehemiah says, he prays with a heart ready to do something. If we're able to bring that up, Justine. Verse 11. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. It wasn't just a prayer. It was a prayer with a heart that said, I want to do something. He'd seen the mess. He was distressed by it, but he wanted to do something. It wasn't that wishy-washy prayer of send someone else. It was, I want to be part of this. Give your servant success today. It's not prosperity teaching. It's not that type of thing, but it's a bold prayer that says, We've seen what's happened. We've seen what needs to be done. Give your servant success today. That's how to pray boldly before our God, prayer team, that says, give us success today. We want to see it today. On hearing the news about Jerusalem, its people, Nehemiah set his heart on doing something about it. But he needed to speak to the king, and without God's intervention, he could do nothing. He was fearful going to the king, so he prayed as he approached the king, and the king granted him favor. There might be some scary things ahead, but as we pray, God will intervene and open some doors. God's, Nehemiah's prayer was simply this, God use me to make it better. There were elements of this prayer as we wind it up that make this prayer effective. There was praise and thanksgiving of who God was. There was repentance, confession of the sin. There was a specific request remembering the promises of God and there was a commitment that it wasn't about someone else, it was down to me. Dorothy came up to me just as I was trying to be super spiritual <laughs> and preparing my, te- uh, my preach. Uh, and she asked me a question as to whether I knew where a certain Uh, passage was in the Bible let me tell you don't ever do that to me because I really haven't got a clue (laughs) I have to google it I have to search it what keyword Uh, could it be this one yeah it is it's that one Uh, please don't do that to me but 
she mentioned a few key words. So I looked, uh, I looked it up on, uh, on the internet and it brought up a few passages. Well, it brought this one out, which I think links so nicely. So I'm nice and fluid. I don't just stick to my notes. This happened this morning. Uh, Dorothy mentioned about the mysteries of God and the hidden things. Well, one of the passages was Psalm 78, uh, and I'm going to read it uh, from uh, the message version. Psalm 78, verses 1 to 4. It might come up if uh, Justine's got it, but Psalm 78, 1 to 4. Listen, dear friends, to God's truth. Bend your ears to what I tell you. I'm chewing on the morsel of a proverb. I'll let you in on the sweet old truths, stories we heard from our fathers, counsel we learned at our mother's knee. We're not keeping this to ourselves, we're passing it along to the next generation. God's fame and fortune, the marvellous things he has done. What a great passage. Um, what I really like about that is that it reminds us we have to remember what God has done, but we're not going to keep it for ourselves. We're going to pass it on to the next generation. So as part of this rebuilding process, we need to remember what God has done. We need to recognize our part in it, and then we need to pass it on to the future generations that are going to continue or finish the job. That psalm says it brilliantly. I'm going to finish with a quote from Spurgeon. Oh. <laughs> I've never used one of these quotes before. <laughs> Should go down well. <laughs> Dorothy looks suitably unimpressed. <laughs> she doesn't even know who Spurgeon is. <laughs> Um, Spurgeon said this, laying the matter to heart, Nehemiah did not begin to speak with other people about what they would do, nor did he draw up a wonderful scheme about what might be done if so many people joined in the enterprise, but it occurred to him that he would do something himself. That's where I'm going to leave it. Because in all this, I hope that you will go away from this in this season and say it's not about Mandy and Martin. It's not about the trustees. It's not about the core leaders. It's not about everyone else doing something which I'll perhaps get involved with. It's about actually thinking and understanding, praying and realizing that there's something that you can do yourself. That's what Nehemiah did in his prayer and throughout that story. Amen.